Hello everybody, welcome back to a special episode of Next Slide Please with special guest Ella. Ella what? I don't know if you want me to say your full name for um, promotional purposes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just for that good, good SEO, please make sure <laughs> to include my Twitter handle and everything you say. <laughs> At GJ Watts on Twitter. <laughs> for all your drama podcasting goodness. Yes! Oh. That is what I do! <laughs> uh, today I am talking to you about Rivers on Fire. Rivers on Fire? Burning Rivers. Oh my goodness. Burning Rivers, dramatic reconstruction of a burning river. Um, is that meant to be not the Thames? Uh, yeah, it's an old picture I found, uh, an old drawing I found of the Thames, I think from the like, 1800s. D- did the Thames ever go on fire? Must have done. There was so well, much sewage in it. Well, okay. Let me let me say <laughs> you are all very nice people. Like you a lot, but you wouldn't set the Thames on fire. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what I do. <laughs> you wouldn't pirate a handbag. <laughs> that's, that's a slide I've made. Um, uh, no, the Thames was never on fire. That's why it, it formed the like the an. It's an impossibility in the phrase, oh, we wouldn't set the Thames on fire. I see. It's a mm. special river because you couldn't set it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, the thing is, is this a challenge? Because I can put some gasoline in the, in yeah. the Thames and set it on fire. Oil spill time. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, let's, let's get to that. Um, so in the summer of 69, nice. uh, this, <laughs> this very phallic river um, in Cleveland set on fire. This apparently spurred the much of the environmental movement in the United States. It got lots of attention. There were no actual pictures of it because it only lasted about half an hour, caused about $50,000 worth of damage. Um, and apparently this was all sta- solved by federal intervention into Cleveland's water. Um, and river fires were not unusual uh, around this kind of time they'd happened in Detroit, Baltimore, Buffalo, Philadelphia and at least 13 previous times on this on the Cuyahoga River. They're just like, oh that that just happens. It's just sets it's just catches on fire sometimes. Nonetheless caused a massive media kerfuffle and possibly like significant change in United States environmental law. I like that. I like that word. A media Media kerfuffle. Yeah. (laughs) If you want any help um, visualising what 14 river fires looks like, I've done this nice graph for you. (laughs) Uh, One fire is a fire. (laughs) Right? So how many is that? It's 14. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, So in the 1880s, Rockefeller was quoted discussing... Thousands of barrels of oil poured directly into the river as a part of a constant process of trying to get rid of them. Um, in 1881, the mayor of Cleveland described the river as an open sewer. This is a nice uh, article published in 1922 about the causes of obnoxious tastes and odours sometimes occurring in the Cleveland water supply. Obnoxious. Spoiler alert just industrial waste um <laughs> it apparently tastes particularly bad in the tea obnoxious taste sounds like like my tastes <laughs> <laughs> but you know this is why i'm surprised that the thames hasn't been set on fire because i know that the thames had the same problem in the 1800s where it had just become an open sewer and it was making everyone sick and diseased and like they needed to come up with ways to kind of outsource the filth of london further and further mm. down the river um, but you'd I need, think... like, methane and combustibles specifically, though, right, for it to sound fire, like, oil I mean, and they, methane. They or... were just pouring poop into the Thames. <laughs> There's going to be some so, methane. So they were, they were pouring poop into the Cuyahoga as well, but, like, until kind of the 50s, the, basically, if you're an industrial city in the United States, the main requirement was that the river be navigable for commerce reasons. Right. Really nothing else. Um, because capital is king. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
laughter. It's wild. What horrified done, laughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, but then, um, in 1952, there was a fire on the river. This isn't the fire <laughs> we were talking about before. This is one of the th- 13 previous fires. Um, <laughs> so if we go this whole they're... presentation without a single picture of an actual fire on an actual well, river, <laughs> I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> For two reasons. First reason being the 1969 fire, which was the really famous fire, didn't have any photos taken of it. It actually wasn't that big of a fire. The 1952 fire was a massive fire. It was somewhere between half a million and one and a half million dollars worth of damage. Um, And the photos of that were actually used by the national press, um... For, to represent the 1969 fire, uh, but they're also copyright, so I don't have them. How, um, how, how do you damage a river to $1 million worth of damage? Well, how you, you damage, damage water? the stuff that's around the river. Oh. So a big explosion and oh, boats and train lines. Okay. And... I just thought, like, you were valuing water at a million dollars. <laughs> no, they clearly aren't. <laughs> there's a... <laughs> But so so this this major fire in the early 1950s did have an impact on the consciousness of residents in Cleveland. Even though there'd been a bunch of fires beforehand, this one was, was particularly big. But also, a lot of the Cleveland residents were moving out to the suburbs, and so being further away from it and not living with it every single day, it seemed like a bigger deal. Um, and so there were there were movements to clean up the river from the early 1950s very slowly um such that in 1959 they the the cleveland plain dealer (laughs) reported that the river actually had some fish in it which was is that a real fish it doesn't look like Uh, a real fish i don't really know (laughs) it's an image (laughs) it looks like a fish from do you remember the the will smith film shark shark tail oh yeah 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 sexy fish this one looks like it should be called gary has a boyfriend obviously (laughs) (laughs) yeah so through through the 1950s and the 1960s there was like an increasing drive from the increasingly suburbanized population of Cleveland to slowly clean up the river. They uh, hired a private boat to go around and try and skim off some of the stuff from the top of the river, Um, push it somewhere else. I don't really know what they did with it afterwards. I I don't know if they just dumped it in some other natural Dumped in a river further away. (laughs) Punk it in the sea. Punk it in the sea. Yeah. (laughs) But it was slow progress, not least because repeated um, requests to state and federal government for funding fell flat. Like, I've got a quote about the Ohio government. The actions of state government demonstrated that it's possible to approach the point of doing nothing to solve the problem while creating an atmosphere of action. Which, wow. <laughs> yeah. That, that sounds like local government, to be honest, doesn't it? <laughs> the passive aggression in that quote. That's so good. There's this um, there's this podcast called Citations Pod that does a lot of like really good like sort of educating you how to like think critically about media stories and and like manufacturing consent and stuff. That has this whole mm. thing about um, like setting up like committees and inquiries and things and and they do it specifically so that they can put an issue to bed and not think about it anymore not so they can actually like take like proper action or whatever Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the the governmental equivalent of lampshading yeah 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 so by 1968 despite um perhaps some some life (laughs) in the river uh a federal report uh, stated, at times the river is choked with debris, oil, scum, and floating globs of organic sludges. Tag yourself, I am a scum. (laughs) I'm floating globs of organic sludges. (laughs) I guess I'm debris. (laughs) That makes me oil. I don't want to be oil. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, there was 
national attention after the 1969 fire um, and and everybody clamoured to place blame, <laughs> essentially. Um, the Dr. Emmett Arnold, chairman of the Ohio Water Pollution Control Board, told the Cleveland Plain Dealer, really great name for a publication, several days after the fire, he was unaware of the board ever taking legal action, a fine or revoking of a permit for pollution violations. We can usually get these industries to be good boys, he explained. But apparently not good enough. Yeah, no offence to Golden Retrievers. I wouldn't want one running an oil factory. It's sort of the horse in the hospital situation. There's a Labrador in my oil plant and I don't know. (laughs) No offence to oil factories, but they're not good boys. (laughs) (laughs) Can I just take a moment to really uh, talk about the name Emmett? (laughs) Are are we going to talk about Twilight here? Twilight, what? I was thinking Isn't about Emmett Brown. I was thinking of Back to the yeah, Future. <laughs> I, I there, also there was thinking also of Twilight, to be fair. Twilight, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, God. I didn't, I've never seen or watched or read or done anything to Twilight. <laughs> oh, my God. Emmett Twilight's backstory is that he was chairman of the Ohio Water Pollution Control Board. <laughs> that would make sense, because he's a vampire. <laughs> then in 1970, the federal government after years of of doing nothing, (laughs) um, informed Cleveland that they failed to meet federal water standards, um, which angered the mayor, to say the least. Um, But this this was all happening in a context of national deindustrialization, basically. So, so while the 1952 um, fire was much more significant really um at a national so it, the money had to move out of the way a little bit before the the environmental right. message just, could get across right so basically they only managed to pluck up a an environmentalist campaign around these things that had already been happening for a mm-hmm. long time because the tide had already started to shift and like well a, they were sending these industries to other countries already, basically, right? And then um, the other part of the research that I did for this, uh, aside from some sources that I'll probably put in the description, um, was watching the first half an hour of the Simpsons movie (laughs) to see whether, as, as in this case, in that case, all of the blame is placed on the residents of the city mm. rather than on a national failure and prioritization of yeah. profit over habitat i just i just love the fi- idea that after like 20 years of the river literally being on fire the government is like your river's bad and they're like yeah we know mm-hmm. we've been saying that it's it's on it's literally on fire <laughs> <laughs> like we are aware of the problem like yeah. i just oh man I don't want to either like overstate or understate the significance of of people who are active within Cleveland. Like for a long time, industry was where the jobs were, and also it was where the residential areas were, and so it was just basically accepted. Um, and then for a long time, well, I mean, except lived with. <laughs> You're like not gonna bite the hand that feeds you, even if you recognise that. The, as a living condition it's not great you don't want your tea tasting of petrochemicals um but but like the environmental movement within cleveland definitely started before it became a national issue but the national it's the national change that gets the praise and it's cleveland that gets the disdain wasn't with the national thing wasn't this the climate scientist who went around because it was like the hottest summer of re- on record and he threw like giant toy dice on like news shows and he'd been trying to get people to pay attention for like a decade and everyone ignored him they were like you're crazy and then it was the hottest summer on record and finally they're like oh man it's the hottest summer on record we've got no stories invite the scientist on and he like rolled dice and was like we're gambling with the fate of our planet and he was the person who kind of popularized awareness of the environmental movement oh, oh i didn't know that 
I I listened to an episode of oh my god um one of one of the ones about American history it's um but it's all about like where kind of modern media myths come from because basically he did that for a summer everyone cared about environmental stuff however then when he finally got onto biggest national news the Republican Party in, enshrined fighting environmentalism and climate change in their party values um and then there was a national TV news debate in in the US and on one side was like a person from MIT this climate scientist and then in the interest of balance the uh news presenters invited on the owner of an oil factory who got onto TV and said this isn't an issue of climate science this is an issue of white collar blue collar look at that MIT scientist he's super posh in a nice suit I'm gonna lose all my boys jobs and suddenly it became a partisan issue about class and then Republican Party kind of started to switch their tone and and then and therefore we're all gonna die in twenty years. <laughs> yeah, you know. Love balance on TV. That's really yeah. Weird. Balance. False dichotomy as well. Balance means um, letting us he- all hear the voices of the bad guys. And disproportionately um, representing them. Mm-hmm. This has gotten very depressing all of a sudden. <laughs> sorry. Can we talk about fire I'm sorry. again? I did <laughs> one about. Most stuff up. I did one about industry and the environment, which was maybe a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's go rush to the end, shall we? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> here's a lovely quote. <laughs> However mild the actual fire may have been, it gave a third degree burn to Cleveland's image. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that is a. Uh, I, I bet the person who wrote that was very pleased with that day's work. <laughs> They just clock yeah. off. It's three o'clock. Let's just clock off. I'll go to the pub. It's fine. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> I thought you were going to get to fracking and all those, um, like, there's so many videos of people, uh, yeah, in in locations where they're doing fracking, like, setting their water on fire because there's loads of methane mm. in the water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes. And all... And all and all of the uh, all of the earthquakes they cause, you know, and the contribution to the increasing uh, cl- climate crisis we're in. Do you know what? Turns out these environmentalists may have had a point fifty years ago. Yeah. Mm. Who's mm. <laughs>